everyone and welcome to the Leader Sound series. I'm Gayatri and today we have Eddie Turner with us. Eddie Turner is an in-demand leadership development expert and has been recognized in the top 30 ranking of Global Gurus and achieved the rank 6 in the Motivational Speakers category. Eddie is one of Marshall Goldsmith's 100 coaches. He is an official ICF mentor coach. Of the more than 50,000 ICF members in more than 150 countries, Eddie Turner was recognized as an ICF coach of the week. Eddie is the author of international best-selling book, A Seasuit Advisor, and the former host of Keep Leading Podcast. Eddie studied leadership and organizational behavior at Northwestern University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree. He holds an executive certificate in the public leadership from the Howard Kennedy School. We are extremely honored and equally excited to have him with us today. Welcome, Eddie. We are super thrilled to have you. Hi, guys. What an honor to be here with you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So without further ado, let's get started. As a principal consultant and executive coach, could you share a bit about your leadership journey? Sure. I started off as an information technology professional. And as an information technology professional, I was not in a formal leadership role. And I spent the great majority of my career um, learning how to lead without authority. And that's a language that I didn't understand until much, much later in my life. But essentially, I went from information technology to the work I do now as a leadership development uh, professional. And uh, along the way, that meant taking classes, learning more about leadership formally and informally. And that happened at places like General Electric, Northwestern University, and Harvard University. That's that's such an exciting journey. And uh, so let's talk about your book. Like, what are the genesis of the book, uh, 140 Simple Messages Guide uh, to Guide Emerging Leaders? And how did you come up with 140 Simple Messages? I'm really curious to know that. Well, the publisher had a format where he used uh, simple pithy messages of uh, 140 characters or less. And I decided to sign on with him because, his name's Mitchell Levy, and because I believe in that format because of the work I'd done for Forbes. I had been uh, writing for Forbes and posting uh, responses to their Q&A section on Forbes.com. And they require 400 characters or less. Prior to that, I might not have been as convinced that you can be effective in that short amount of characters. But I saw what would happen when 10 of us would just give a 400 character or less response. Mm. As few as 2,000, but in many cases, 30, 50, 70,000 people would read those posts. So I realized that, you know, everybody doesn't always want a long, lengthy answer. Sometimes people want just a quick snack bite. So when I recognized the effectiveness of that, I decided that this would be a way for me to condense a lot of the things I say when I'm working as a coach, when I'm speaking as a professional speaker or facilitating a classroom, I find myself quoting a lot of people. And I quote people who've influenced me, my mom, my dad, uh, other uh, relatives, professors, friends, people of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of note in the news media. I quote all these people. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I were able to pull some of these quotes together and make this the basis of the book? And that's exactly what happened. It, uh, my, my focus area was emerging leaders. And my focus area was emerging leaders for two reasons. Number one, that is the group that at the time I was doing some, some of my, mo- my best work in. And I'd say probably my most important work. But then also, I wanted to expand the lens of what we call an emerging leader. So in the book, I listed eight. And since the pandemic, I've added a ninth area that we should look at. when We're talking about emerging leaders. And the fact is, it's not just that young, high performer in an organization. I believe that we all are or should be emerging as a leader. And post-pandemic, we've learned that there's a need even if you're at the senior most level of leadership, that you must emerge as a leader during times of crisis. That's a completely different skill set. 
very uh, great initiative i would say and uh, as you said yeah today if you see people are people get distracted very easily and they are having really short attention spans so such quick reads and you know in consumer consumable format is like it's very much impactful so i yes. agree with you that is there a time where conflict is not something that's bad but it's actually good for leaders to have in their lives conflict can be constructive in other words two people don't always have to agree hmm. the absence of an agreement can be a conflict where there is a, a a warring if you will but at times this conflict becomes constructive where if you and i don't see eye to eye you're saying eddie i, I know this is the way you see this issue but here's how i see it and from my perspective eddie here's why this is so important well you are helping me to see something that i may with my own eye be missing i am not seeing it as clearly as i should and so that type of uh, conflict is good where conflict is not good is where uh, a person destroys another person destroys their reputation destroys them psychologically it destroys their career that type of conflict is not healthy and doesn't benefit anyone and that in fact is not leading but the conflict where it's constructive that's where a, a person allows another leader to get better because it actually takes leadership of the person who's willing to introduce that rather than go along with the group or group think, as we say, in organizational behavior. Uh, it takes real leadership to use conflict effectively. Well said, Eddie. Uh, I personally feel even communication and feedback is really important in such cases. So as you said, when it's two, like two ways and you get to know like what exactly had happened. Yes. In one of your articles, you have mentioned that you look up to Kenny G, and not just as a talented <laughs> artist <laughs> that he is, but you could all, like could you please elaborate on the leadership lessons that you have learned from him? Yes, yes. The article I wrote about uh, leadership lessons from Kenny G. I was a tremendous Kenny G fan growing up. I absolutely loved Kenny G. And I still do, but I was like really, really radical growing up. <laughs> I just, I mean, the moment I heard his music, I'd stop what I'm doing. Any video, anything I saw to read, I just was consuming it. So I, I'm, I'm probably not as voracious as I once was, but uh, to me, he just was a fantastic saxophone player. And I loved his music. It was a different sound. But what was so interesting is I thought I knew everything about him, but when I watched this documentary that aired on HBO in, I guess it was December or so mm -hmm. of 2021, he, there were some facts that I didn't know. And so I was just, uh, I, I just I loved watching that and I ended up writing this, this article as a result. But I saw him through a different lens. In this, in this case, I am no longer the IT professional or doing things that I was doing when I was first exposed to him. Now I'm a leadership developer. And as I think about developing leaders and I'm watching the Kenny G story, I started to understand and see him in a different way. Here's a man who was not afraid to step out of the box. So often we tell leaders, step out of the box. But then when they do, we, we want to put them back in the box. Yeah. Kenny G decided, no, I'm not going to play it the way everyone else plays it. I'm going to, I want my own sound. And that takes courage. It takes leadership because the traditional way of thinking is here are the greats. You play it the way these greats played it and you copy that, you imitate that. You can improvise and do a little bit on your own, but these are the standards. And Kenny G said, I'm gonna do a little bit of that, but I also wanna do a little bit of this. I'm gonna mix it up a little different way. And by doing that, he went on to produce his own genre of jazz. So pre Kenny G, it was just called jazz. Post Kenny G, there's jazz and smooth jazz, an entirely different category. And I remember this radio station in Chicago that I didn't realize was born because of Kenny G. WNUA 95.5. I listened to that growing up when I remember uh, being 14 years old, 13 years old, 
and calling into that radio station, winning tickets to Katie G's concert. So the ability to go ahead and start your own genre of music, think about the significance of that. All the while, all the purists, all of the historians, all of the experts are saying he's not real jazz. Mm. And, you know, condemning him. I think that's sad, but he's willing to stand out. And as a result, he has become the single most popular instrumentalist of all time and the highest selling instrumentalist of all time. So if you were to ask me, do I want to be the most well-known or the most wealthiest? I probably would pick the most wealthiest <laughs> because he may not be the most well-known. When people ask about who the jazz greats are, there's a list of names that will come up and Kenny G's name may not come up. But if, uh, with, when you ask purists, you ask the average person on the street, they all know Kenny G. So from that perspective, he actually has both. He's the most well-known and he's the wealthiest of all time. And he did that because of exercising a different type of leadership. And so I think there's a leadership lesson from what, looking at that aspect of Kenny G that I would not have looked at before. And so the other component of him I'd say really quickly is leaders lead and the great professionals do what they do, not just for the sake of an award. They do what they do because they love their profession. And so to this day, he still practices four hours a day. I didn't know that until I saw the documentary. It did not surprise me that he still practices, but four hours a day, that was quite telling to me. And so I asked myself, how much time am I practicing my craft? Am I putting in the work year after year, day after day, or am I resting on my laurels? So I thought that was another really good lesson for leaders by listening to Kitty G. That's very inspiring and it's very important. You know, you should be passionate in what you love to do. And uh, like I have even read that uh, because of Kenny G, you like you even started learning some instrument, musical instruments. Is that true? Because of my love of Kenny G, I did what? Yes, you have started. Yeah, you had even you you know you started playing some instruments, musical instruments. Oh yes, no. So yes, absolutely, yes, ma'am. I played the soprano saxophone. Oh and God. I played the soprano saxophone just like Kenny G. I played that because of Kenny G. If it were not for Kenny G, I would have only played the normal saxophone. I shouldn't say normal, but the alto or the or the tenor saxophone. Because of Kenny G, I did go ahead and start to play a different saxophone <laughs> and uh, play the soprano. And I patterned my performing after what Kenny G does. My performing was based on uh, his style and, and all of the moves and don't necessarily play at the front of the room, come from the side of the room, the back of the room. Uh, all of that was patterned after Kenny G. Amazing, amazing. So if you could, what advice or message would you like to give uh, your 25 year old self? The biggest advice I would say to my 25 year old self is to get a mentor. So, that my career would have, my, my career took a different step once I understood what a mentor is and started having someone who was guiding me and directing me and not leaving things to chance. Waiting for your supervisor, manager, boss, director, whoever they may be to discover what your talent is and help you grow that talent doesn't work. And it didn't work for me. Uh, I eventually got a mentor who changed my life. But if I had met that mentor, seven years sooner, which would have put me at 25, then my life would have been very, very different. So at 25, that's the advice I would give. That's the advice I give young people even today. Oh, I, that's very important actually. So that was a great and enriching and also very insightful conversation, Eddie. I'm sure it's going to benefit our viewers. And thank you so much for your valuable time and insights. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Bye.